This is the Soval SVO7 Plus. And at the time of recording, it's retailing for 379 US dollars. It's one of the first larger clipper printers to come through my workshop with a build area of 300 by 300 on the X and Y and 400 millimeters on the Z, the classic CR10 form factor. I'm pretty excited to see how these clipper features work with a bed of this size, so let's jump right into assembly. The gantry bolts onto the side of the base instead of up through the bottom, which makes assembly a breeze and you don't have to do the awkward printer half off the table balancing act to get it secured. It also has some metal reinforced pieces here as well. I'm not sure if this approach is as effective as the support struts we've seen on other machines, but at least some thought was put into frame rigidity here. On the base, we have a tool drawer, which I'm usually not a huge fan of, but since this machine comes with an accelerometer, I found this one to be pretty handy. I was pretty skeptical about this single PC case fan that provides external cooling, but it actually pumps out a fair amount of air. It's definitely loud, but then again, so are all the other external part cooling fans I've seen or heard so far. Of course, this is a clipper machine, and the brains of that are stored in the screen here. On the bottom of the screen, there's a Type-C port, two USB ports, a port for the accelerometer, and a barrel jack for a power lead that comes from the printer. One of these ports will be populated by the male USB connector to connect to the print board in the machine. On the side, we have a power button along with another USB port. And on top, we have two indicator lights. Let's open this screen up and check out what's inside. Here we can see it's using the MakerBase MKS Clipad 50 version 1.1. There's some flash storage here and a Wi-Fi chipset as well for wireless network printing. The UI on the screen is pretty good. There's tons of options here and it all seems to fit well on the smaller screen. Most of the options you need for tuning the machine are here, including a Z-Tilt, which levels the X gantry to the bed, which is pretty handy. Speaking of the bed, it comes with a double-sided PEI-coated spring steel sheet that attaches magnetically. It has some notches on the back and they correspond with screws on the bed to easily align the sheet after removal. It also came with a polycarbonate bed sticker to be placed on the PEI sheet if you have adhesion problems, but I threw that out instantly. The manual is really well done with tons of minute setup details that most companies seem to forget like wheel tension adjustment, belt tensioning, and even extruder idler tension. When it came time to level the bed, I noticed that they put some aluminum leveling knobs on this machine. Seems a little counterintuitive to add weight to an already heavy bed, but I quickly realized they had supplied some spacers and nylon lock nuts, so you can just switch this out. I think this should be done at the factory and the springs and knobs should be included. After all, this machine has mesh bed leveling and independent Z-axis alignment. The print head is pretty large and sticks out from the frame almost 4 inches. Under this shroud is a pretty stealthy looking extruder assembly with a larger than standard heat block to keep up with fast printing. There's a single part cooling fan in here and another to cool the heatsink for the extruder. There's also an inductive bed sensor here for the aforementioned mesh bed leveling. This machine utilizes sensorless homing so they've added some secure points on each axis for the print head and bed to bump into. I leveled the bed and then jumped straight into printing. I want to get a before and after resonance calibration print, so I opted to print a file on the included USB called Cable Tray. I'm not exactly sure what this is for, but it's a 20 minute print, so it should give us a quick baseline. Once it was done, I moved on to resonance tuning. All you have to do for this is bolt the sensor to either the print head assembly or the heated bed. Then select the auto-tuning feature for the correct axis and the machine will test a series of frequencies to determine the perfect input shaping value. It's then auto-applied to your config file, which is pretty cool. After I tuned for resonance, I printed the cable tray file again and here are the results. Pretty cool to see the impact of that. Also, this model secures onto the Z-axis bracket to hold the wire harness for the print head assembly. I set up my time-lapse camera and did some test prints using the provided Cura profile. 
first I printed some of these pylons which hold wood off the ground so you can paint the edges. They turned out a little funky, but I think I just have some weird geometry in this model, so I moved on to a larger file. This Holy Death model from Pipecox. Despite my best efforts, I ended up testing the filament runout sensor during this print, and as advertised, it worked. It kept the machine at temp and waited for me to replace the filament and resume printing. Of course, I didn't have more of the same filament, so it's a pretty obvious change here, but I think this model will get painted, so I'm not too worried. There's quite a bit of wispy stringing, but after looking at the profile, I saw the nozzle temp was set to 190 and the bed temp was set to 50. For just under 10 hours of print time though, this came out pretty good, with a fair amount of detail even at a layer height of 0.2mm. For the next print, I upped the temperature and threw in a more challenging print, this tree sculpture. This one failed in a pretty spectacular way due to bed adhesion. I didn't clean the bed after assembly or apply any glue, so this shouldn't be a hard problem to deal with. The part of this print that completed looks fairly good and these smaller areas here printed hotter and have a better glossy look to them, so I think I can bump up my hot end temperature even more. One final print here, these print in place cord winders. These turned out great and took under two hours to print. So here are my initial thoughts on the Sobol SV07 Plus. For the price, it's got a lot of potential, and with enough tuning and calibration, you could have a really fast printer with a sizable build volume. The UI on the screen is one of the best I've seen in this price bracket, showing you things like a heat graph and real-time speeds. Okay, a few complaints here. I think printers of this size should be shipped with a larger diameter nozzle. I would like to see a 0.6mm nozzle included in the box just to cut those print times down even further. I'm not a huge fan of the dull baby blue color scheme and would much prefer black and the Times New Roman-esque font of the Soval branding is a little bit of an eyesore. The Soval SV06 and 6 Plus both use 8mm smooth rods and linear bearings which I was really hoping would make an appearance on this machine, but instead we have the same old V-slot wheels. Let me know in the comments down below if you'll be picking this machine up, and if not, why? Special thanks to Soval for sending this machine over for me to take a look at. I'll leave a link in the description if you'd like to find out more. As always, thanks for watching and happy printing.